Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, to the Jews who had believed in him, but now something has changed. Something has encountered them, and they are in conflict. There are many hard teachings of Christ, things that are difficult to receive, things that are difficult to understand, hard, hard to believe. The Trinity is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one divine essence, three distinct persons, and yet our God is one. Another hard teaching is that salvation comes to no one except through Christ Jesus. Only in Christ does one have eternal life. Or how about that Jesus is God? Not just a man, but true God and true man. That God, our God, dies. Or that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. For His flesh is true food and His blood is is true drink. And yet we behold with our eyes bread and wine. But we partake. We partake in faith and in reality the true body and the most precious blood of Christ. But not all hard teachings of Christ are, are hard because they're difficult to hear or understand. But rather, the difficulty lies in abiding in them, of holding fast to them, of being and remaining a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that is the daily struggle of the Christian, a struggle that I know each of you faces, and each of you faces it boldly each day, for when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. 499 years ago tomorrow, that was the first of the 95 theses hammered on the church door. When our Lord Jesus Christ said, Repent, He willed the entire life of the believer to be one of repentance. And that is why each and every day, indeed each and every moment of every day, is a return to baptism. A return so that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die, along with all sins and all evil desires, and that a new man should arise, emerge to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. But in this veil of tears, we continually face hard teachings. And there arises within us that conflict. For on the one hand, the new man hears his master's voice. 
hears the voice of the good shepherd and yearns to abide in him, to abide in him in the field of righteousness. But on the other hand, the old Adam hears another voice. It is the voice of your former master. And it's a siren's song that calls you back calls you back to captivity, to Babylon, that woman arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup. But it's a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. Sin adorns itself with outward beauty and it promises pleasure and it promises freedom. Freedom from the tyranny of God. That stuffy, old, doddering fool who would have you not have any fun at all. No joy. But amen, amen. I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Now we know that no one is righteous, no, not one, and that all have turned aside. No one does good, not even one. But Christ is not here speaking of the incidental sins of the Christian, what St. Paul calls the law of sin that dwells in my members. For as he says, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. That is the daily struggle of the Christian that we mentioned before, the daily contrition and repentance that drowns the old Adam and brings forth the new man. But when Christ here is speaking about those who commit sin, it's literally those who make or do sin, who make the choice of sin enter into league with it, who make provisions or excuses for the weakness of the flesh, who make it a custom to sin, who abide not in the word of God. And sadly, there are many that are led astray in this conflict, and many turn from Christ and no longer walk after him. They make and do sin, preferring the comfort of their former lives, the company of their fellow slaves, and the false freedom promised by the devil. See, far too often we think of freedom as being able to do and to live and to think and to say whatever it pleases us, to be master of our own domain in charge of our own destiny, to forge our own identity. But this is really not freedom at all. It is instead an enslavement, an enslavement to the passions, to be moved about by whatever silly whim comes within our mind, whatever urge directs us in one way or another. The true freedom, the true freedom is found only in the gospel, only in Christ, who is himself truth, the way, the truth, and the life. For you see, the truth sets you free first by showing you the truth of your condition. It shatters any and all illusions that we might have that your works can merit salvation, that you're somehow good enough 
for God. It shows you the depth of your depravity, that you are a lost and condemned person, desperately in need of a Savior. And then the truth sets you free by showing you the truth in Jesus Christ, that He is the Son, the Son who dwells in the house forever, and He has authority, authority and power to make you truly free. For while the law shows us the reality of sin, the gospel shows us a greater reality, that where sin is increased, grace abounds all the more. And it is the freedom, the freedom to serve God with a pure heart, free now to live according to the purpose for which we were created, free to be that amazing, wonderful, beautiful creature the pinnacle, capstone, crown jewel of every creative work that God had done. For the Son has redeemed you, purchased and won you from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. And when the world comes to enslave you again, either by hook or by crook, by the laws that say you must do this, you must do that, to imprison you as the Pharisees had done with the people of Israel, compounding law upon law, work upon work, until no man had any hope of ever being good enough. Or of Rome in the medieval Catholic Church that compounded work upon work upon work. That when you sin, you repent, but not only that, now you must make satisfaction. You must do to merit forgiveness. It was against that tyranny, that false freedom, that Martin Luther called the attention of the shepherds and the Pope. No, this is not what the gospel teaches, for we hold that we are justified. We are justified by faith, apart from the works of the law, made free by the Son who has given himself to die for us, to do all work and every work, to merit your salvation. And he gives it to you free as a gift. And as he stood before Emperor Charles, and had before him the books that he had written, he was asked, do you recant? It would have been easier for Martin Luther to have said, yes, I recant. He was under tremendous pressure. Do not break apart the church. Think of our unity. Think of what you are doing to Christendom. Just give this up, Luther. Give this up for the sake of unity. Luther, don't offend. Don't call to light the wrong teachings. Don't hurt these other Christians by saying that what they have done is wrong. Recant for the sake of friendship. Recant. and how he must have been tempted. In fact, the first day that he was asked to respond, he said, give me time to look this over, to think what I have done. 
And he returned the next day to the same question. But he returned a changed man. He said to them in a clear voice, in a room packed with people of every rank and privilege, the papal legates, the emperor of the whole empire, and said, unless I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture and by clear reason, I am bound by the Scriptures I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. And at this, the room erupted, some jeering and booing at this upstart who would destroy the church, and some cheering praise for one who would stand firm by the clear gospel. And so it's no wonder that the words he spoke next have not been recorded by some who were there, but have been recorded by others. For amidst this noise, Luther said, Hier steh ich, ich kann nicht anders. Gott helfe mir. Amen. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. And God has helped us and has helped each of you. For in baptism the Holy Spirit has come upon you, called you by this gospel, and enlightened you with his gifts, enlightened you in the truth. And that abiding in him, you receive Christ's true body and his precious blood. What Martin Luther calls the precious antidote against the poison within. You, brothers and sisters, you have been made free. Free indeed. Now be certain of that freedom. Be certain of salvation from sin, for faith is certain, because the promise of God is certain. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it.